today I've got this nice combinatorial number theory problem that came from the short list to the 1998 International Math Olympiad. So the statement goes like this. We want to determine the smallest natural number n, which is bigger than or equal to 4, so that we can choose unique numbers a, b, c, d from the set of n integers. So I'll just say that set is x1, x2, all the way up to xn, and that's like any set of n integers. But then they have to satisfy, or the numbers that we choose from that set must satisfy a plus b minus c minus d is a multiple of 20. But we're actually gonna use the equivalent statement to this being a multiple of 20 using modular arithmetic, and that is a plus b is congruent to c plus d modulo 20. Okay, so let's maybe look at the best case scenario first. And well, what would the best case be? Well, I would say the best case scenario would be we have a large number of incongruent numbers in this set. So let's suppose there are m incongruent, and I guess I should say modulo 20 elements of our set x1 all the way up to xn. Notice if we have elements that are congruent modulo 20, they're like pretty much acting exactly the same as each other. So putting one over here and putting one over here doesn't really do much. So we've got m incongruent mod 20 elements of x1 through xm. Well, how many pairs of elements can we take from there? And why would we want to take pairs of incongruent elements? Well, that's because we've got a pair of two of these numbers over here and another pair over here. So let's maybe look at that question. So how many pairs, what I mean by pairs, again, pairs of the incongruent mod 20 elements. So that's just m choose two, right? So that's gonna be m choose two, which is equal to m times m minus one over two total pairs. So using the fact that there are 20 residue classes mod 20, we need this number to be bigger than 20 in order to guarantee that two of the sums have the same value. In other words, they lie in the same equivalence class. So when does that happen? Well, let's just multiply this out. We need m squared minus m to be bigger than 40. That's just by multiplying that two over there. But that means we need m squared minus m minus 40 to be bigger than zero. But then just by like some elementary algebra, we can see that this occurs if m is bigger than or equal to seven. So in other words, if our set has seven incongruent elements mod 20, then we can immediately find four of them that satisfy this rule down here. So what does that tell us? That means that n, that tells us that n cannot equal four, five, or six. And why is that? Well, if it's four, five, or six, then we will most definitely not have seven incongruent elements. So it's probably easy to construct one of these sets that doesn't satisfy this property. But if a set has more than seven elements, it is not guaranteed to have more than seven incongruent elements, or at least seven incongruent elements anyway. So that means the smallest value is probably not seven or eight, because that's not really large enough to guarantee all of this to work out. And so you might wanna play around with n equals seven and n equals eight to try to find some sort of example of a set that does not exhibit this property. And maybe I'll just give as homework, check that the following eight element set does not satisfy this property. So what's the eight element set? Well, it'll be zero, one, two, four, seven, 12, 20, and 40. So if you look at this, 
there are exactly six incongruent numbers here. So 0, 20, and 40 are all congruent mod 20, but these are all incongruent. So there are exactly six congruence classes exhibited in this set. And playing around with it, you can see that every quadruple of elements chosen from this set does not satisfy this rule. So I'll just put here that this doesn't work. So that tells us that n must be bigger than or equal to 9. But once you're getting to n equals 9, well, there's kind of a lot to work with. So that tells us that this probably is exactly n equals 9. That is, if we've got a 9 element set or larger, then we're guaranteed to be able to find a quadruple satisfying this rule. So let's maybe go ahead and clean this up, and that's exactly what we'll prove. Okay, so like we pointed towards on the last board, our claim is that n is nine. That is, every set with nine or larger elements has the property that you can take four unique elements and arrange them so that a plus b is congruent to c plus d modulo 20. Okay, and I want to point out that on the last board, we proved that there is a bad eight element set. And what I mean by a bad eight element set is an eight element set that does not satisfy this property over here. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and consider an arbitrary nine element set. We'll call it X1, X2, all the way up to X8 and X9. So that's a subset of integers as needed. Okay, now there are two cases built into this that are important to look at. The first case is, well, maybe I'll call this A. So A has seven incongruent elements. But in that case, we're done by our previous observation. So I'll just write that down, done by previous. So let's instead assume that A has six or fewer incongruent elements. So A has six or fewer incongruent elements. So let's list them in the following order. Let's say X1, X2, all the way up to X6 are possibly incongruent. They're not definitely incongruent, but they're possibly incongruent. And then the last three, so that would be x7, x8, and x9, are the ones that are congruent to earlier in the list. So, Let's write that, so congruent modulo 20 to one of these over here. Now let's break this down into two cases. So let's say case number one is x7, x8, and x9 are all incongruent. Okay, so that's most definitely one possibility. Then in that case, I'll just introduce some new notation. I'll call x7 y, I'll call x7 x, x8 y. But that means that there's an x1 through x6 that is congruent to x. Again, because of the, our observation over here. And there's an x1 through x6 which is congruent to y. So let's write it like this. So there exists an i and a j, i not equal to j, where xi is congruent to x and xj is congruent to y. And this is all happening mod 20. But if we have that set up, we clearly have x plus xj is congruent to y plus xi modulo 20. Okay, great. And now let's look at the second case, which can really just be spun off of this first case, and that would be at least two of these are incongruent. Well, it's 
pretty much the same argument because we only use the fact that two of these were incongruent here. So we had two were incongruent, but they were congruent to something on this list. And then we like did opposite sums of them. Well, that's clearly just gonna be congruent mod 20. Okay, so now let's look at case two. And that is X7, X8, and X9 are all congruent mod 20. Let's introduce some notation just like we did before. We'll call this one X, we'll call this one Y, and we'll call this one Z. Well, those are all congruent mod 20, but by our early argument, they're congruent to something in here mod 20. So there's a W from the set of the first six where W is congruent to X mod 20 which is also congruent to y and z mod 20. But if these are all the same, then very clearly we have x plus y is congruent to z plus w mod 20. Because we're adding two copies of the same thing mod 20 on either side of the congruence. Okay, that's a good place to stop.